I take this seriously. Uh, I have ministered to, my first book was to women, Women Thou Are Loose. I ministered to thousands, perhaps millions, no doubt millions of women around the world, uh, but also millions of men. And, and though I love the opportunity to do either, I think this is, there's never been a more needed time to speak to men than right now. It is hard to insulate yourself from the changing world that we live in, the changing ideologies around us, the changing definitions around us, the changing realities around us, the changing economics around us. Uh, Pastor Dobbin said something, he said, if you're a man and you know you're a man today, what does that mean? What, what does that mean today? Our grandfathers defined it one way. Grandmothers defined it one way. Parents defined it one way. What does that mean to be a real man? <laughs> the world's definition of a real man has changed and is changing and is evolving and it's affecting everything from sexuality to economics to standards of attractiveness to value and worth and roles in the home who are you are you a real man what does that mean how do you define that we want to bring clarity to, to some of that today to touch on some areas that I think are very important for us to talk about. I was, somebody's, whoever left your phone up here, somebody's calling you. <laughs> Is that your phone? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, somebody wanna see you. I was praying about how to, you talk about men of destiny. Every, everybody in here has a destiny and a purpose to fulfill. And that the Bible talks about that the thoughts of God are good toward us that we might have an expected end. That we would end becoming what he meant for us to be. That when everything is said and done that we would evolve into the man he wants us to be. That's a lifelong journey. That's a lifelong journey. You don't do that in a weekend. You don't do that because somebody laid hands on you. You don't do that because you said the sinner's prayer. You don't do that because you got a wife. You don't do that because you got a job. A car won't make you that. Money won't make you that. In fact, money will only make you more what you were before. <laughs> it won't change a thing about who you are on the inside. So most of the things we pursue in life won't, won't do that. The church even sometimes adds to the damage because we, we put destiny on sale. <laughs> and we make destiny easily attainable. You know, it's idealistic. Uh, we, we talk to you about destiny like it has no drama in it. <laughs> we make you shout about it, <laughs> dance about it get happy about it and pursue it. We talk about destiny like it has no drama, so when we run into drama, we abort destiny. We show you our stars and not our scars. All of us show our stars, not our scars. We don't post any ugly pictures on Instagram. <laughs> If the picture doesn't look right, we don't, we don't post it. Even if we have to doctor it up. So we're living in a world of false realities. And with false realities comes a certain sense of shame. Because the other picture wasn't lying either. <laughs> so 
So our need to present ourselves a certain way, and we all have it, I mean, I, I don't want to look just any kind of way. Our need to present ourselves any kind of way must also be coupled with the Siamese twin of I don't want you to see the other me. Because you might not like that me. So there's a lot of pressure between image and reality. And sometimes we spend so much energy on our image that we never work on our reality. And if we never work on our reality, then the image gets bigger than the reality and we become an imposter. Come on, man. Come on, man. And the pressure that goes along with being an imposter is stressful. Because you have to fake it every day. <laughs> you waiting for me to preach, I'm preaching already. You have to fake it every day. You have to fake it every day. In a world where we are inclined to evaluate our masculinity by our accomplishments, we hide ourselves because we don't want you to see us like men in a locker room turning into a corner. Do I measure up? And if we don't measure up, we'll find something to help us measure up. Mm -hmm. Don't look at this, look at that. <laughs> don't look at that, look at the other, look at the car, look at the house, look at the job, look at the, the degrees I have. But when you lay down at night, you don't sleep with a degree. You don't sleep with a paycheck and you can't get the car out of the garage into the beds. You, sooner or later, you're left down to your realities. And I want to talk to you about your realities today. And, and I'm going to talk about it from the context. I'm going to borrow the words of the Apostle Paul. And I love this text in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 uh, through 15. I'm just going to read it as a point of context. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, notice that gold, silver, precious stones, and then it declines to wood, hay, or stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any, if any man's work abide, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And uh, normally we use this text from uh, eschatology pers perspective, dealing with, with, with the end of an era, and, and ultimately he lands us at the judgment seat of Christ. But I, I just want to extract from the text morsels of truth just morsels of truth. I don't want to exegete the text. I don't want to really even preach the text. To be honest with you, I, I'm really primarily focused on one word in the text. And it is a master builder. Okay. And, and so I've entitled this presentation, and it's going to be interactive because I'm going to need you to do it, Master Builder. So just for rehearsal's sake, say, I am a master builder. I am a master builder. Yeah, I'm a master builder. Now, if, if you understand that you're a master builder, a builder comes prepared to build his dream. He doesn't wait on the dream to happen. Now, there's a big shift in thinking there. 
because we have a tendency, particularly of faith, to think that if we pray enough, the dream will happen. But the Bible with close scrutiny does not bear that out. The truth of the matter is, Paul says that he is a master builder. So we can come and talk euphoric ideologies like destiny, and we can get excited about words like that, but what does that mean? And what are you prepared to build? Now, Paul says, no greater foundation has any man laid than that which was laid by Christ Jesus. So Christ says, I got the foundation. I got you covered. I got you covered. I, I dug out the footers. I'm from West Virginia. You all don't dig out footers down here. <laughs> you all do pier and beam construction. In West Virginia, we dug out footers and built basements and built a house on top of it. I dug out the footers or I put in the pier and the beam. He said, I, I, I laid the foundation. Okay. But I left the building up to you. See? And Paul lets us know that we have options of the materials we work with. That we could work with wood, hay, or stubble and build a house and it would legitimately be a house. I grew up in a wood house. You can build a house out of wood. You can build a house out of hay. You can build a, a house out of stubble. I was in Africa and a woman had built a house out of cow dung. And that was the norm and it becomes hard like concrete and they use it in the bush to build houses. You can build a house out of dung. So if success is accomplished by just building the house, whether it is dung or diamonds, it's built. Wood, hay, or stubble is preceded by gold, silver, or precious stones. Because gold, silver, or precious stones could withstand the trial of fire. Now, true enough, if you get it hot enough, gold will melt. Silver will melt if it gets hot enough, but even melted, it's still what it was. The fire can never change what it is. If a diamond goes through the fire, it may be burned, but it is still a diamond. But wood, if it goes through the fire, the fire changes its reality. And the inference in the text suggests that the fire determines the construction. So we already know we got two things to look at. We got one thing is what am I building on my foundation? Okay. Is, is it something that will withstand the fire? Is it solid? Is it true? Is it real? Is it stable? Is it steady? And the second thing we have to realize is no matter what I built, I'm going to get burned. So if I am a fire dodger, I will never be a builder. Because this text suggests that the fire comes to reveal the material you've been working with. So there is not a man, whether he is wood, stubble, or hay, or whether he is gold, silver, or precious stones, there is not a man in this room that won't get burned. And the oddest thing about men when we go through fire, we generally say nothing. Can you imagine if the room caught on fire right now and we burned up in this room? I would be quite verbal. <laughs> I'm not the kind of person that would just take it. Take it for the team. Hold on to my masculine dignity. Burn with power. I would scream like a little girl. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would go down with no dignity at all. 
I'm telling you right now, don't expect that out of me. If I have to do that to be your pastor, I resign right now. I would go out like a five-year-old girl, okay? Because I hate fire. So if we would do that in the natural, and this text is referring to the spiritual, and when we go through the fire in our lives and say nothing, where does the scream go? I suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, there's a couple in here, that we scream inside. That we scream silently. That we scream while we drive to work. We scream in the shower. We scream in prayer. We scream, we scream in praise. We scream with liquor bottles and dope bags. And all kind of stuff is screaming. Ask your brother, are you screaming? Yeah. I mean, I didn't hear you say anything, and I'm sure you don't do it around me. But when life gets crazy, how do you scream? Do you scream in the way you treat her? Do you scream by collecting more and more women like trophies or boys? Don't, oh Lord, because it's all in here. All, all of my fallacies have been shattered. There are different ways of screaming. And then we argue amongst the screamers over which scream is better. At least I don't scream like you. But how do you, how, how, how do you, how do you scream? And are you screaming in a way that you told yourself you're having fun, but it's really screaming? Because if we don't get down to what makes you scream, then we can't build what makes you dream. You, you, you cannot get through this world without fire. And fire at different ages and different stages to a man is different. Yes. Yes. What burns you up at 20 means nothing at 50. <laughs> you think that ain't nothing. But when you get 50, there's another kind of fire that burns you than what burned you up at 30. What burns you up at 30 is, is running out of time and, and, and do I have what it takes and am I enough? If you haven't answered that question by 60, you just stop asking. <laughs> you make peace with it. I'm not going, it's like getting tall. I'm not going to get any taller. My son is two inches taller than me. And I had to accept that. <laughs> I didn't say I like that, but I had to accept that he comes by and places his hand on my head like, like I did when he was five. But I had to accept the fact that I will not get taller and I had to be good with 6'2". I can't spend the rest of my life trying to be 6'4", because that season of growth is over. 
in my life. So he's going to be taller than me, and I have to be okay with that. And we preach the same message to the same people as if we're all going to rise to the same height. But in a great house, there are vessels of honor and dishonor. There are different ages and stages in development. And you don't have a house full of kids. My mother had 15 siblings. You can't have 15 kids and all of them be the same age or the same gender or the same height. And we talk to you generically. which sometimes increases the shame of do I measure up? Don't look at me. I, I, I don't want you to see me. I'm changing. I don't want you to see me because I'm, I'm comparing myself with you. But wait a minute. Are you my destiny? Paul says when you compare yourself with one another in so doing, you are not wise. Because you can't compare yourself with me because you don't have the same materials. You don't have the same level of gifting. So it, it comes down to every man to find out what do I have to work with? Because I can either complain about what I don't have the rest of my life. My father didn't raise me. My mother left me when I was 10. I was when, when I was 16. Somebody did it. We spent the rest of our life talking about what we don't have or you can assess what you do have and start building. But what I want you to see is that you got to build it. It is not going to happen arbitrarily. It is not going to happen automatically. It's not going to happen spiritually. You must be the master builder. You are the architect of your future. And if you don't build it, it won't happen. Well, let me do it this way. Let me break it down this way because I want to be scripturally succinct. And in order to be scripturally succinct, I should say that God is the architect, but you're the carpenter. Okay, okay. Prove that. The Bible says, they that build the house labor but in vain that build it. Except God build the house, they that labor, labor but in vain that build it. Except God build the house, they that labor, labor but in vain that build it. Except God build the house, they that labor, labor but in vain that build it. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If God built the house, why do we have anybody laboring? And then I started to realize that God built it by design. So when God got through drawing up the plans, he's through building the house. God is an architect. That is the design. That is the purpose. He, he is through with the construction when he submits the drawings. Here is the drawings for what you can be in your life. But you can't move into a blueprint. You cannot bathe in a blueprint. You cannot drive a blueprint. You, can, you cannot sleep in a blueprint. You cannot invite people into a blueprint. It is just a blueprint. The Bible is a blueprint. Except now, they that labor, labor but in vain. If you're trying to build something that God didn't design for you, you are wasting time. And the worst thing in the world to waste is time. I'd rather you waste money than waste time. I hate to waste money. I hate for you to waste time because I could conceivably get some more money, but I cannot get some more time. Do not waste time trying to build things that are not on your blueprint. So in order for you to maximize this, this time with me today, we have got to be willing to dismiss all the things that we are trying to build that are not on our blueprint. And we got to get down to having a conversation with the architect to say, what are the specs on me? 
for somebody with the intelligence that I have and the ability that I have and the talents that you gave me, what am I accountable for? Because I'm only accountable for what you gave me. If you only gave me one talent, I'm not accountable like the guy who's got five. If you only gave me three talents, why am I comparing myself with the guy that's got five? But for what you gave me, what am I building with what you gave me? Touch your brother say, I'm a master builder. I'm a master builder. In order to be a master builder, I have to understand the materials that I have been given. I have to understand where God stops and I began. Because if I don't understand where God stops and I began, I will blame God for my laziness. I will blame God for my failure. I will blame God and say, I tried you and you didn't work. I paid my tithes and it didn't work. I came to church and it didn't work. I gave my life to Jesus and it didn't work. Oh yes, it worked, but he stopped at the foundation. I just drove a preacher through a neighborhood that I, that, that I built, not the church, but that I built on some property that I bought, and I built 40 houses on it. What I didn't tell him is that I entered into a joint venture with a land developer. I bought the land, he put in the infrastructure, infrastructure being drainage and water and all of that, and then we sold to the, to the general contractor to build the house. So the general contractor is my customer. You understand? And then he sells to the customer who bought the house and he gets his money, but I got, I got the contractor's money, he gets the customer's money, and that's how the deal works. So I was out when the land was developed. I got paid before the houses were built. <laughs> <laughs> Be because you got to understand what the deal is, okay? The de you, if you don't understand the deal, you can't do the deal. Ooh, I'm spitting out stuff. For <laughs> if you don't understand the deal, you can't do the deal. And most of us don't understand the deal. And we're trying to do a deal that we don't understand. And we don't understand what we are doing or how to do what we're doing because we don't understand the deal. So I, we, we're going to clear up some stuff today. I'm glad you came. We're going to clear up some stuff today about what the deal is and how it works. God says, I gave you the same foundation. First, as God the Father, the Creator, He gave us the same foundation when He gave us life. All souls are mine. So we come here and we all leave here the same. Rich people leave here just like poor people. Rich people and poor people are born just the same. You can't get rich enough that you don't have labor. Okay, so we come the same and we die the same. And the only thing we're responsible for is the middle. Because the beginning of the book and the end of the book has been written. So there's been a date been set for you to be born. There's been a date been set for you to die. And all of that is finished and all of that is settled. And all you're responsible for is what happens in the middle. Then if you're born again, from the time you accept Christ as your foundation, as Lord of your life, that foundation, no greater foundation has any man laid than that which was laid by Christ Jesus. And upon this foundation, some men built. You see, see, he, he was out of the deal when he saved you. I'm done. I got you there. You have arrived. Now, <laughs> y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I got you saved, I got you on a good foundation, I got you off drugs, I got you cleaned up, I got you delivered, I washed away your sin, you have been born again, I gave you a second chance, I gave you a fresh start, you have been born again, and upon this foundation some men built. Thank you. Hallelujah. 
What, what are you building? And some men are not building at all. They're still at ground level zero. They're still there with the drainage pipes in and the water's been running and the electricity's there, but there's no house there because they're waiting on the Lord. And you're waiting on the Lord that's waiting on you. And don't turn into an angry, bitter old man because you wasted your youth building wood, stubble, and hay. And don't become a hater of me. <laughs> because some men built, some men built, touch somebody and say, some men built. See, it's, it's fair, it's fair. It's, it's the only thing that's fair is birth and death. It's absolutely fair. White folks, black folks, brown folks, rich folks, poor folks, it don't matter what kind of person you are, we all come the same and we all go the same and we know that the beginning and the end is fair because God does it. Everything past God is debatable. Some men built. Some men built, some men built, some men built, some men built. Okay, if you're going to build something that's going to last, are you strong enough to withstand the men who resent what you built? Are you tough enough to withstand the obvious inevitable criticism that comes because some men built? Or is winning their approval more important, more important to you than building something that is solid? Maybe because you got daddy issues. And any form of criticism or rejection reinforces rejection you already had. And so you make the goal changing the mind of somebody who doesn't matter. Let, let's talk a minute, let's talk a minute uh, about daddy issues because, because the, the, the thing that got me on this trail was over and over again in the scriptures when God hands plans, I told you God is an architect, he handed plans for Aaron's garment. He didn't sew it, he handed plans for Aaron's garment. He handed plans to Moses for the tabernacle. He handed plans to, to, to David for building the temple that he passed on to Solomon. He handed plans. And that over and over again, we hear the phrase in the King James Version, build according to pattern. Build according to pattern. Now, if you miss this, you miss the whole thing. Okay? Build according to pattern. Say that with me. Build according to pattern. Say it again. Build that I, I, I was sitting up looking at this text and I was thinking about this text and I was thinking about building according to pattern. Moses built, uh, Noah built the ark according to pattern. God designed it, told him how many cubits it was to be. All Noah had to do was build according to pattern. But if he didn't build according to pattern, his whole house would be lost and his kids would drown because his kids were living in their father's ability to build according. So it's not just that I'm building for me, I'm building for my kid too, because my kids will live or die based on my ability to build according to pattern. But if I resent authority and I don't like following instructions, then my kids might be in a jam because I'm building without a pattern and wondering why my family's drowning. Build according to pattern. Say it again. Build according to pattern. Say it again. Build according to pattern. Say it again. Build according to pattern. 
okay, I'm going in, I'm going in. Are you ready? Can I go in? I'm going in, I'm going in deep, I'm going in deep. What got me started was when I started thinking about the word pattern, I started thinking about fathers. And the reason I started thinking about fathers because, was because of the Greek word pater, which means father, or you say my paternal grandparents, which means it's my father's mother or father. It is my paternal, pat from the word pater, which means father. And then I went back and did word research and found out that there is an association between the word pater and pattern. So, so a lot of times since I can't see God, Now, I know some of you are deep, you can see God, but me, I got these glasses on, I, I still can't, I can't see God, but I can see my father. And so, I, I built, according To pattern. Now, 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 my mother had a degree in home economics and in science, and so one of the things I understand about a pattern is if there are no sleeves in the pattern, there'll be no sleeves in the dress. <laughs> if there's no pleat in the pattern, there'll be no pleat in the skirt. That's why fatherhood is important. It is very, very important because having a father and a good one becomes important because the pattern is the pattern. And in the absence of a pattern, what do I build? I'm going to talk about that too. I'm going to get everybody. <laughs> I'm not going to leave anybody out. So we're, 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 we're building according to pattern. We cannot help what our fathers did or didn't do. But we can stop it from happening again. Your son and your daughter will be affected by your pattern not your preaching. I can only hear what you do. <laughs> I cannot hear what you say. As a son, I can only hear what you do. And so I build according to pattern. And some of you have done really well, even though you don't think that you did really well, you have done really well because you, you, you really built it without a pattern. You, you got to where you got with no pattern at all, just hitting a, <laughs> this is real old, hitting a lick of miss. <laughs> you, 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 have to, you have to have gray hair to know what that means. Hitting the look, just hitting that, just trying to figure it out. And you've been trying to figure it out. And I think a window would go right here. It'd be nice if we had a window right here. I don't know how big it's going to be, but I, I think I might make it. Uh, I don't know. Let me see. I'll just, I'll just uh, cut it at two and a half, and, and, and let's see if we can. And then you built, so you framed it all in, and found out there wasn't a window that size. So you had to take it all out, and so you're behind on your delivery date because you never had a pattern and you spent all of your life trying to figure out how does this work. So forgive yourself for being behind. You did good for not having... I ought to have 30 seconds of crazy praise somewhere. I did good for not having a pattern. 
See, see, I, I have been in my head, I've been going through this thing in my head because everybody's talking about mentoring and mentoring. And he's my mentor and she's my mentor and I need a mentor. I want you to be my mentor. I mean, you know, I'm so sick of this age because we, we just, whatever everybody's saying, everybody wants you to be their mentor. And did you, mentor me. Can you mentor me? Mentor me. Mentor me. Mentor me. Mentoring is nice. It's nice. It's nice. Modeling is better. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, I can, I can learn certain things from you from you mentoring me, but I am more apt to become what you model in front of me. So, so can, can, can I work on this a minute? So upstairs we were talking about uh, some guys who were raised by women. They, we all have the same emotions, but we learn to express our emotions by the, by the pattern in front of us. And a lot of times, so when mama laughed, she fell out like, ha, 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 get out of here. And so now the boy is running around, ha, 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 get out of here. He's having the same feelings that all of us have but how you express those feelings. See, d don't confuse behavior with sexuality because that has nothing to do with being homosexual because you can be masculine and be homosexual. Come on, come on, come on. Sit, just keep sitting there. I'm gonna get you in a minute. See, we, we, we haven't even got to the sex piece. What we're talking about is how do I express this feeling that I'm having? I express it according to the pattern. Or if daddy got mad and when he got frustrated and he had a bad day at work, he came home and slapped mama. That means when I come home and I feel frustrated, I have the same feelings, but I'm looking at my pattern as to how to express that rage. And the next... And, and I can easily, as a man, fool around and become what I hated. Or maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't hit her, he just didn't talk. And you hated that he never talked to you, and you hated that he never validated you, and you hated that he never told you that he loved you, and you hated that he never communicated to you, and now you're a young man, a 20-year-old man, a 25-year-old, 30-year-old man, and you're married to somebody who said, you just don't communicate. I, you, you just don't, you, you don't infuse any feelings and you're standing there and you don't know how to do it. Because you built according. To pattern. Y'all still with me? You with me? We're doing good? We're doing good? We're doing good? I, I, I want to get this down because because I realized in my own, this whole thing about modeling versus mentoring, I realized my father never mentored me. He never, he never mentored me. He just modeled things in front of me. And so I defined masculinity by what he did. And what he mostly did was work. So there's not me nor any of my siblings that won't work because that's what was modeled in front of me. So as soon as I got hair on my chest and my voice dropped down an octave, and, 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 and you know what I mean, all the other stuff that goes along with that st stuff right there, when all of that stuff like that and my, everything like that started happening, my cousins from Mississippi say everything like that, when everything like that started happening, you know, I, I stepped into the model, the pattern, and I demonstrated the pattern, and some of you have a pattern that was flawed, and some of you have no pattern at all. So Christ comes and says, let's start this over. Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must be born again. 
He said, let's start this over. Because at first time, you know, the pattern wasn't too cool. And there were some flaws in it. This time, you must get it right. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay the foundation for you. So that you don't spend the rest of your life blaming your father. I'm going to become your father. And I'm going to step in and give you the specs so that you can become the man that I created you to be and find the joy and the peace and the fulfillment that only comes when you build what he designed. Tell somebody, tell them, I'm about to start over. We're going to wipe the slate clean. We're going to move out all the debris. We're going to move out all the, we're going to cancel out all the mistakes and the craziness and the foolishness and the drama and the hysteria and the anger and the frustration and the, all of the stuff that has been messing me up. And we're going to wipe it all clean and start it over. Now, don't bother me and don't mess with me because I'm already late. I'm already off schedule. I'm 20 years behind. I'm 30 years behind. I'm 35 years behind. I don't have time to play game with you. I got to hurry. Am I talking to you? You do not have time to build the same mess you built before. You got a second chance at this. Now you got to get it right because Jesus says, I'm going to be your pattern. I'm going to lay your foundation. I'm going to get you started. Now you be accountable for what you built. Build it up again. Touch three men saying you got to build it. If you want a happy home, you got to build it. If you want a successful marriage, you got to build it. If you want your children to admire you, you got to build it. If you want to be economically stable, you got to build it. Ain't nobody going to will it to you. Ain't nobody going to give it to you if it's going to happen in your life. Slap your brothers say, I'm a master builder. 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 I feel a praise about to break out in this place. I'm a master builder. I'm a master builder. I'm a master builder. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. That whatever you've been praying about, whatever you've been asking for, whatever your vision is, whatever your dream is, whatever God put in your spirit, I want you to understand your responsibility. He does the designing, but you must do the construction. So get your hard hat. And get your toolbox and gather up your stuff because you got some building to do. And if you do not build it, you cannot live in it. I swear, I promise, cross my heart and hope to die. Nobody is going to build your house for you. You must build your house yourself. What you must understand as men is that we are called to be builders. Not just dreamers. 
not just wishes, not just hopers, not just prayers, builders. And what you build depends on what age and stage you're at. But from the youngest boy in this room, from the youngest boy in this room to the oldest man in this room, every last one of you are called to be builders. Every last one of you are called to be builders. Never stop building. 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 Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. You 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 build houses, you build hearts, you build homes, you build people. What, wherever you are, you were put there to build. So stop crying about what's not there. And then don't give me this, and I don't have that, and I didn't get that. Uh, shut up! And build it. Never stop building. Amen. Slap your neighbor and say, never stop building. Never stop building. My uncles who lived to be in their 80s, my uncles who lived to be in their 80s and 90s, I, I, hang, I like to hang around old people because they become a barometer of what's next in my life. And they told me the biggest mistake they ever made was when they retired. And, 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 I, and I walked away and I tried to think about what they were saying. They said, it's horrible to wake up in the morning and have nothing to do. You can only vacation so long. Now, you can, the point wasn't you can't retire from a job, but if you retire from a job and stop building, you have no purpose. And as soon as you lose purpose, you lose passion, you lose power, you lose strength, you lose brain power, you lose creativity. Never stop building. When you get where you can't do it anymore, build your sons, build your grandsons, build your grandchildren. And when you get where you're sitting up and you're sitting up in a wheelchair, roll your chair in the room and build up the next generation. Never stop. But I can't do it anymore. I'll build up the next generation. I'll get there and I'll do it vicariously through them. When I can't run a touchdown anymore, I'll teach the next one how to make the touchdown and I'll clap while you make the touchdown because I will never stop building. I will never stop building. I will never stop building. It's not going to happen. If you don't like builders, don't be around me. Don't marry me. Don't hang around me. Don't befriend me. You can't run with me because wherever I am, I'm going to build something. If you hand me something, I'm going to turn it into something else. I got building in me. I got to build something all the time. I came in the other day, and up out of the blue, I, I made a, a, a sweet potato cobbler just out of the blue. I don't know why I made it. I just made it to see if I could make it. Put it on Instagram after I made it. Didn't hardly even eat any of it. It wasn't about eating it. It was about building it. I'm such a builder that I just got to keep building something. And if you don't give me something, I said, what we got in the house?
See, a builder is a baker and a baker is a builder and yeah. both of them are working with whatever, what do you got in the house? Okay. Am I talking to the right men? Yeah. There ought not to be a man in the room that ought not to be building something. How can you be a gift to me if you're not building me? How can you be an asset if you don't make an addition? When you walk in the room, the dynamic ought to change. When you walk in the room, the dynamic ought to change. The only number that doesn't add to another number is a zero. And if you are not a zero, the numbers ought to change every time you walk in the room. When I see you coming, I ought to see addition coming. Multiplication just walked in the room. He just added something to the atmosphere. Never join anything and add nothing. So, maybe there's several things I want you to get out of this. Some of it is, what was wrong with my pattern? Because I got to fix the pattern in some cases. Okay, because I am as much a product of my environment as I am my DNA. Both of them produced me. That's why all the smart people who sit up in smart rooms and smart places can't decide whether it's nurture or nature because it's both. That's why I love exposure. Because the world as you know it is not the world. It's just as you know it. <laughs> My brother and I went to Los Angeles. He went ahead of me. He went in a different way than me. He went at a different stage in his life than me. And he stayed with relatives and didn't have any money. And he ended up living in Watts and had horrible experiences. And he hates L.A. today because of what happened years ago when he was in L.A. And the way he describes L.A. is totally different from how I describe L.A. Because I came much later in my life, stayed in Beverly Hills in a penthouse suite, was brought into L.A. around a whole different circle of people. And we're both talking about the same place. Some of you have never been to Dallas, though you live in Dallas. You really only live in a part of Dallas. So your ideas about Dallas are based on as you know it. You, you haven't even fully discovered where God put you. <laughs> you, you only see it as you know it. And that's why the biggest word I know in the English language is exposure. Because I could take you some other places, and even though you lived here all of your life, you lived in a community, not in a city, and I could show you another part of Dallas that you never even knew existed because you have not been exposed to it, and if you cannot see it, you cannot be it. What are we not seeing? What are my blind spots? What am I not seeing in my own house? What am I so busy that I'm not seeing in my own son? What am I not seeing in my own wife? What am I not seeing in my own life? Because it can't, they can't be it if I don't see it. Right. 
Talk to anybody who's been divorced, and they'll tell you things that they see now that they didn't see when they were in it. Talk to anybody who's lost a spouse or lost a loved one, and they'll tell you things that they see in retrospect that they didn't see in real time. What are your blind spots? And, and are you talking out of your pain? Are you, are you talking about something you really don't know about? Because my brother swears he knows Los Angeles. And I swear I know Los Angeles. And our planes both landed in the same city. But we had two totally different experiences based on what we were exposed to. Neither one of us are lying. He is telling his truth, and I am telling mine, and we're talking about the same place. If he drove me into another neighborhood, I would understand why he feels the way he feels. And that's the problem with having people making decisions about areas they have never been. I listened, and there was a comment made some months ago, a very uncomplimentary comment made about Nigeria, and then they were interviewing all of these senators about the statement that was made about Nigeria and, and the other countries in Africa, and everybody who had an opinion had never been there. Right. <laughs> How can you know if you don't go? You have to sit where I sit to understand why I think the way I think. Until you sit where I sit, until you see what I see, you won't understand my reality. So exposure goes both ways. Okay, sit down, sit down. Y'all get me fired up. Don't do that. Because if you egg me on, I'll keep going. Because I'm a builder. I'm a master builder. I see you as materials. <laughs> I see you as materials. I see you as ingredients. I see you as possibilities. I don't see you as problems. I see you as potentials. I want to know what's in the house. What can I make with that? <laughs> I'm a master builder. Ain't no way you can be around me long and me not bill you. If you go to lunch with me, I'm going to bill you. If you come to my house, I'm going to bill you. If you start texting me, I'm going to bill you. I'm a master builder. If you give me an idea, don't give me an idea you don't want me to touch. Because if you give me an idea, I'm going to build something to it. I'm going to add a wing to it. I'm going to add a side window to it. I'm going to put a skylight in it. I'm going to do something to it. I'm a master builder. I get amazed at people who go to surgeons for physicals. Don't go to a surgeon for a physical because a surgeon is going to find something he can operate on. He's a surgeon. He's going to cut you somewhere. That's what they do. I'm a master builder. If you want to stay like you are, leave now because you got a master builder up on this stage. And if you stay in this room, Woo. If you stay in this room, if you stay in this room, I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you rolled in this room. I don't care if you're 12 years old. If you stay in this room, touch three men. Tell them I'm getting ready to build something. Okay, I'm going to dump the rest of it. Sit down, I'm going to dump the rest of it, then I'm going to open it up for questions and conversations and stuff like that. Make it hard to sit out, Bishop. <laughs> I make it hard to sit out? Good. I want to get you so fired up. I want to get you so daggone fired up. I want to open up your head to so many possibilities. 
I want to teach you until you stop feeling sorry for yourself and complaining about your wife and complaining about your life. I want to build you up till I set you on fire. Slap somebody and say, never stop building. You want to get a woman, you want to get a woman, you want to get a good woman, you want to get a woman real fast, you want to get a woman like you, you want to get a woman, you start building something. Start building something. Start building something. You start building something. How can I be a help me? How can I be a help me? If you ain't a builder. I can't be a helper. I can't, be a, I can't be an assistant to a plumber if you ain't a plumber. How can I assist you when your goal is to keep it like it was? You so boring to follow? Because God called me to follow you and you parked. And I, I'm not leaving you because I don't like you. I'm leaving you because you're not moving. And I'll leave you for somebody uglier than you. I know he ain't sexy as you, but I'm used to you being sexy. Now sexy is normal. I could give up on some of that sexiness and see some building. Because cute is only cute at first. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. You know how when you first get a new house, you walk in the house and you just be sitting there looking at it? My God, I can't believe we did this. Look at you, Jesus. Look at God. Look at God. Glory to God. You go over to the other side of the room. You look back at the other side. Look at God. If my grandmama could see me now, look at God. That's about two months. After a while, you walk in the house. You just walk in the house and throw your stuff down and go on about your business because what was exciting became normal because it's not changing. It's not growing. I sent you in the garden, Adam, to build it. To dress it, to tend it, to develop it. You're a builder. What happened to you that you stopped building? What hurt you so bad? that success became stabilizing. The first thing Jesus says when he comes to Mary and Martha, and they're having a big fit because he mixed the funeral. He, come on here and say it to me right now, just like that. Show me where you laid him down. Show me where you stopped building. Now, let me just dump this. I can't even, I'm trying not to elaborate because I don't want to take much time. There's a, there's a, there was an outline in my head to share with you and it's been with me for over a year and a half. And it was, write this down, gray beards, pink slips, and blue pills. <laughs> Gray beards, pink slips, and blue pills. Gray beards, pink slips, and blue pills. Gray beards, pink slips, and blue pills. Under gray beards is 
the conversation we need to have about aging. Ooh, got quiet. <laughs> because if the only vision you had of yourself was a 20-year-old, then 40 is depressing. And you'll get 40 and you'll try to be 20. Because you have no vision for 40. Or you'll get 60 and get depressed to the point of being suicidal. Because God is trying to wean you from what you understood to be a man was, was based on the ideas of a 40-year-old. And you have no vision for 60. So, so what you build depends on what age and stage you're at. But you can't build what you ought to be building at this stage if you're still in love with the stage that just went by. So when he told me that, I said, now I see why 80% of the suicides in this country are committed by men in their 40s and 50s. No wonder they're committing suicide, because they only had visions for 20 and 30. And when they run into the complexities of 40s and 50s and the equipment changes, they can't scream outside. Oh, I'm gonna tie it all up. <laughs> they can't scream outside, so they scream Oh, wow. And then I talked to the psychologist, and the psychologist says that depression is anger turned in. Whereas I thought depression was being sad. Depression is not about being sad. Depression is about being mad. Depression is about being mad on the inside. So that is the fire that's burning up all the fake materials you defined as a man. So the reason I want to talk about great beards is so that you begin to understand that you have to have a vision for every stage of your life. And I learned that you can't have a new vision until you let go of the old one. And if you can't let go of the old one, you'll spend the time that you ought to have a new vision mourning the death of the old one. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm doing right now is explaining why you feel the way you feel. You feel the way you feel because the fire is burning up all the wood and stubble ideas that you thought were truth. And those ideas were seasonal. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Oh my God, I'm getting excited. Where are my 20 year old, 30 year olds? Stand up. Everything you feel right now, everything going on inside of you, in your head, in your body, in your emotions, in your sex drive, everything that you call normal, that you think is life, that you think will always be the same, will not be the same. It will all change. It is not reality. It is a season. It is a season. It is a season. It is a season in your life. Do not make permanent decisions over temporary circumstances. Whatever is going on in you, right or wrong, good or bad, up or down, it will pass in a minute. While you are in one season, you must be building for the next one. Because you won't have anywhere for your masculinity to live 
if you blow your 20s and 30s complaining about what happened to you when you were 12. Man, look, look. Wake up! Everything good about your age, everything good about your stage, everything good about where you are, and everything bad about where you are will change. It's temporary. All your questions are, am I enough and do I have it? And can I really do it? And I, I'm trying to project all of these ideas and none of it's working and nobody's helping me. I don't know whether I really have it or not. And I wish I'd had a different kind of childhood. I really never. Shut up. <laughs> it will all change. If you miss now crying about then, you won't be ready for what's next. Yeah. Time will not wait on you to get your head together. Time is merciless. It's coming. Ready or not, here I come. You have to understand where you are right now is a moment. It's a moment in time. It's an opportunity. It's a gift and a curse. It's a blessing and a burden. It gives you advantages and it's limiting too. It's both of them. Every stage has its assets and its liabilities. And if you don't learn how to manage your assets and your liabilities in your 20s and 30s, God help you in your 40s and 50s. I'm talking about principles, not problems. You are praying about problems. I am talking to you about principles. God gave you the problem so you could learn the principle. The problem doesn't matter. It's not about your problem. God is trying to teach you how to progress under pressure because at every stage in your life, every stage will have blessings and burdens. It will have problems and it will have power and you have got to learn how to swim in troubled waters. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's going to pass. The arguments you're having with your wife is going to pass. Because what's important to you at 20 and 30 is not going to be nearly as important to you at 50 and 60. And you may not really see the beauty in her until you get to the next stage. Because all of your evaluations and all of your calculations are only based on the stage you're in. Keep building. You, you just got the first floor up. Keep building. Stop walking away from every project and giving up on every dream because you don't understand that problems come with promises. You are sitting in God's promise to me. This very place is God's promise to me. But if you think the promise has no problems, you are a fool. If you are looking for a promise without a problem, you got to die to get it. Because you are looking for heaven. I am talking to you about life. I am telling you what I would tell you if I were your father. It is what it is. And you either groan and bellyache about it and wish you could change it and waste your time at the wishing well of life or you pull your pants up on your behind and stand up on your own two feet and go ahead with your life because you are a master. All, thank you, you may be sitting, all my 50 and 60 year old people stand up. Lord have mercy. Ain't this a change? 
I, ain't, I left my 40s, I'll come back to you in a minute. 50s and 60s, ain't this a change? Ain't this a change that you can't talk about? Ain't this a change that makes you redefine happiness? Ain't this a change where you have to rediscover a part of yourself you have never encountered before? Ain't this a change where you reassess your values and redefine your priorities and refocus on who you are and where you're going? Because you are too young to be an old man. And you are too old <laughs> to be a young man. <laughs> and you are in this nebulous, indescript space in between two worlds. But you have lived long enough to know how the story ends. And the ticking of the clock is pressure. And if you only define success by your 20 and 30 year old self, then your 50 and 60 year old self is depressed. Because you don't think you're no good. Because what you call good is based on a 20, 30 year old evaluation. And you're depressed and you can't talk. And you're depressed and you can't tell. Who would you tell? And you are so private that you don't even want her to know. And you sure don't want the other men and you tried to do what you did at 20 and 30, and you got out on that basketball court and you pulled a ham. No, I'm just, this is men's meeting. And I'm being nice. I could have went to another kind of illustration, but I'm saving that for the blue pills. I'm gonna just stay in the gray hair. We over in the gray hair zone. Am I talking to you? And you are old enough to realize that your grown kids aren't as grown as you thought they were going to be? And you're old enough to have the kind of problems in your house that you wonder at night if it was really your fault? And you're old enough to wonder if you have time to fix it? And you've reached a stage that some of the issues in your life are so baked in that even when you try to be your better self, all they bring up is your old self. And you're a little bit pissed off. Because by the time you figured out what life was all about, you're wondering, do you have the energy and the strength to do anything about what you learned? Welcome to your 50s and 60s. This is where you have to accept I'm 6'2". <laughs> and I'm not going to be 6'4". This is where you come into acceptance about where you are. And if you don't pass the bar of acceptance, you're going to medicate your pain in self-destruction. You have to accept where you are and find a new definition of happy. Because your previous definition of happy was so small, you could put it in a matchbox. The things that made you happy don't work anymore. And if you don't rediscover and build 
a new understanding of life and be happy with what you built in this stage, then you'll start thinking stuff like, my life is over. My best days are behind me. And you'll talk yourself into the grave. And sickness will start to break out in your body because the sickness is a manifestation of what's going on in your head. And you will bring yourself down to the grave because you have not learned to build in the stage you're in. Am I talking to you? I respect you too much to bring you out here and not have anything to say. You're in that stage of life where it is complicated. Where you got grown kids, sometimes by different mamas, who have issues with you that you cannot go back and undo. And now they're old enough to get in your face. And they're standing up in your face and blaming you for doing stuff that they are doing now. And they won't hear you. And this is the age where if you're not careful, you will lose your voice in your own life. And I want you to get your voice back. And I want you to get your happy back. And I want you to redefine yourself in the stage that you're in. And I want you to live your life in such a way that you make the younger men jealous. I want you to get your swag back and get your growl back and get your self-esteem back and stop nursing your secret grief with bitterness and frustration and hidden rage that has turned into depression. And I know I'm standing on sensitive ground. But I came to talk to you because I'm tired of burying you. You think you're old. The president is 70. And the only thing they fighting about is who gonna run again. And you picking out burial plots. Why have you stopped living? You stopped living because your experience with life was based on the eyes of a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old. You need a vision for where you are now. Revise your strategy and get something to be excited about. Am I talking to you? Sit down. 40-year-olds, I got you. Come on. 40. You're right in the middle of it. You're at halftime. You're at halftime. And the odd thing about being 40 now, the difference between being 40 now and being 40 when I was 40 is that you played longer than we did. You woke up late. By the time you woke up and realized that you got to build your own house and that it wasn't going to come to you through osmosis, you were at halftime when we were at 30. So by the time you realized that this really counts and this is really serious and you need to have something to show for it and you need to get yourself together, you were at halftime. And you have the pressure of being late all over you. 
And it either will make you focus or it'll make you lose your fight and give up and settle at a stage you should still be building. Am I talking to you? Yes, sir. 40 years old. The kids are old enough to talk back. It ain't about car seats and baby bottles. It's about car keys. <laughs> and you are fighting your genes in another form. <laughs> and you are at a stage in your life that you and her are together, but it ain't jailed yet. I don't mean you're not there, you're there. <laughs> but the concrete hadn't set yet. And you've had to do some restarts more than once. And you ought to be right about at the stage where you awake now. You awake? But you wonder if you woke up too late. And you're wondering, can you still make a difference? And you wish you had better equipment and more tools, and you wish you would have done more with your youth than you did. And now you're trying to build a mansion, but you're looking at your materials and you're not sure, do I have enough to build it? And if I can build it, can I build it in time? And you're in the adolescence of adulthood. And your testosterone levels are just starting to drop. And you have to work out harder for half the results. And your belly fat is building up. And as your belly fat is building up, guess what? Your emotions are coming up. On, emotions that you didn't have to deal with in your 20s and 30s. And if you're married, you trained her in your 20s and 30s not to be affectionate, be sexual, but not be affectionate. But now in your 40s, you need the affection, but now she bought what you taught. How am I doing? <laughs> and your testosterone masked your emotions. But now the curtain is coming down. And you don't feel appreciated. <laughs> you don't feel appreciated for all you do and for all you gave and for all you go through and for all you suffer. You don't think that anybody really gets. And when they do appreciate you, they don't appreciate you in the language that you need it. And, and nobody is giving you what you need. And you don't even realize that you have never told them what you need. And when you do tell them, you are mad. You can't receive the fact that you trained them for the guy you used to be. You're right in the middle of it. And somewhat like the 50s and 60s, you're in that nebulous in-between space where your whole closet is 20 and 30. But your body is 40. <laughs> and everything that you used to do is based on 20 and 30, and your whole life is designed around who you used to be. And, and you don't know that you need to rebuild for where you are right now. You're still trying to cram you back into what you used to be. 
And as soon as you give up on going backwards, you can go forward. Keep it moving. Touch your brother and say, keep it moving. Am I talking to you? You, you're, you're young men. You're young men. You're, you're still young men, but you won't know that till you're older. <laughs> because by your definition, you're old men because you're the oldest you've ever been. And because you're the oldest you've ever been, you think you're an old man but you're still young men. And you won't know that you're young men until you're in your 50s and 60s, you'll wish for your 40s. Okay. And the men that I just sat down in their 50s and 60s that are wishing for their 40s are wondering why you're wasting your 40s. Wow. Because you are wasting what they are wishing for because you don't see the beauty of where you are. And the 60-year-old men are looking back at you and saying, yeah, I wish I was 40. I would show you what to do with 40. I'd take a 40 right now. I don't, not a 40, but a, I, I'll take 40, not a 40. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Could it be that where you are is a treasure that you have not dug into? Could it be that you are cursing something that you ought to be celebrating? What do we know about you that you don't see about yourselves? You need to talk to us to find out. Because if you would talk to us, it would change how you see you. You can't talk to somebody 20 and 30 about 40s because like, like a gravitational pull, they will pull you into a zone that you can't live in. So you can still draw a 20-year-old girl. <laughs> Big Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you can, Big Daddy. And that would really be good because you get, she thinks you are after her body, but you're really a vampire after her youth. a men's meeting, isn't it? Yes, Are y'all men? Yes, Can we talk? Yes, sir. This may be the toughest hump you ever got over. It's worse than adolescence. It's just like adolescence, but it's worse than adolescence because you're in the middle again. You're in the middle again. You're in the middle again. You're in, again. You're in that nebulous, indescript middle place again. You don't have great fraternity and fellowship with anybody because you're in the middle. You don't quite fit anywhere, not even in your own house. Because sometimes in your 40s, you haven't totally bought into this is going to make it. So you're in it, but you kept your heart out, so you Keep your hurt out. So you come home, your body comes home every night, but you left your heart in the garage. And you're at the stage where you drive around the house a couple of times before you go in. <laughs> How many men know what I'm talking about? You circle around it two or three times. 
like a plane, <laughs> like a plane going around the runway. You know you're going to land. It, it's no question, you are coming home. But you circling around, you haven't landed yet because you got to talk yourself into going into your own life. Because you haven't fully bought into it yet. Because you don't feel safe. Not safe enough to give up your whole heart. Not safe enough to throw all your chips on the table. Not safe enough to let your girlfriend go. Not safe enough. Not safe enough. His eyes shut like I can't believe he said that. I'm talking to you. Safe enough to put all your cards on the table. Not safe enough to be fully engaged. Not safe enough to build a future for your old age. You're still trying to decide whether this is going to work or not. Measuring it by a yardstick from your past. You don't understand that the wife you're going to need is not the wife you used to need. because you haven't embraced where you are yet. Because you're not always sure where you are. So sometimes we build encasements around ourselves to cocoon our uncertainty. So if you have a job, you're, you're there, but you're not always fully there. And if you have a church, you're a pastor, but you're not sure you're going to stay. And you're not sure you're going to keep the house or not. And you're not sure you're going to keep this or that or not. And you're not sure, you're not sure, you're not sure. And, and you're supposed to be sure because you're a man and you're a leader and in charge. And rather than tell anybody that you're not sure, you don't say anything, but you protect yourself against any further pain by not being fully engaged anywhere. But the consequences is the feeling of, of being homeless. So you circle the house. And just the way you circle the house, you've been circling your life. And why do you think other people are going to buy into you until you do? How many are getting something out of this? And you, you know what's really a trip about the 40s? What's really a trip is that you're young enough that your parents are living, yeah, yeah. but old. And now you got the weight of being sandwiched in between aging parents and driving children. And you don't know what to do with either one of them. Because you got kids you don't even recognize. And you got parents that have turned into somebody you don't know. And both of them are calling you, needing something from you. And you're not sure you have enough anything to give anybody because everybody's making withdrawals and nobody's making Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I want to talk to the young men, the group that you're mentoring. Stand up, young men. Wake up. Stand up. Wake up. I want to talk to you. You are the future. You are, you are the future. You are the future with a crazy past. And you've seen stuff you shouldn't have seen and experienced stuff you shouldn't have experienced and you are kids with grown folks' problems. And you are the future, but you're held down by all the stuff and the situations that the grown folks should have kept you from, but you had to go through. And you're so busy trying to overcome grown folks' problems, processing that through a kid's head, that you're missing 
the joy of being a kid. And worse still, you may not be taking seriously the opportunity to be in this room. And you may not be smart enough to know that I'm talking to you, even when I'm talking to them, because I'm giving you a glimpse of what's next. Yes, sir. And you might not really know that it's a gift to be in this room. It's an absolute gift to be in this room. And I will tell you one thing right now. I am who I am today because of the choices I made in your day. Right there, right at that age, right at that stage. The courses you take, the classes you take, the people you hang around, the people that speak into your life are setting the pattern for your future. Don't take the pattern of a fool. Don't take the pattern of a fool. What does that mean, Bishop? Choose who you admire and make sure the reasons you admire them are worth your life because you are betting your life on who you admire. You will only be what you see. So focus your gaze on somebody who did something that when you get their age, you'd be proud you did it. And don't focus your gaze on somebody who ain't going to live to be my age. And if you think that I'm not talking to you, you are deaf. I am betting on you. I am betting that letting you overhear eavesdrop on this conversation will shift you. You have a chance. You might not have money, you might not have friends, you might have been molested, you might have been abused, I don't care about that. You still have a chance. Run, Forrest, run! Run, run, Forrest, run! Run, do you hear me? Run, run! Read everything you can read. Write everything you can write. See everything you can see. Every smart, positive, powerful thing. You can escape where you came from. But you got to run. If you don't run, it's not going to happen. Your future is up to you. It's not up to who touched you. It is up to you. Clap your hands, everybody. Now, this is what I'm going to do. In order to conserve time, I'm not going to do pink slips and blue peels. You're going to have to bring me back to do that. Okay? Let me tell you what Pink Slips is about. Pink Slips is about how you handle money. Pink Slips is about how you handle finances. Has a lot to do with your self-esteem, has a lot to do with how you see yourself, affects your prayer life. I want you to get your finances where you are not talking to God about money. You should not have to be talking to God about money. I want to redefine what you call a miracle. Money is not a miracle, it's just money. And if you manage it right, it won't manage you. And I want to talk to you about how you handle your resources. And I'm just categorizing it as pink slips like layoff notices to talk to you about what are we going to do with a generation of men whose women are starting to make more money than them. And what does that do to your family dynamics? And what is that doing to you? And what are you doing about it? So you invite me back. I'll talk about that. And we're going to talk about pink slips. And then we're going to talk about blue pills. Blue Pills is just an overall heading about the floating 
ages and stages of sexuality. What I want you to do now is this. I have talked to you. I want you to talk to each other for about 15 minutes about what you think about what I said. You don't have to agree with it. You, don't, you, can, you can contradict it. You can do whatever you want. I might not have gotten all of you in my description. I, this is a disclaimer. It's a lot of you in here. But how many of you did I get? 